Hi everybody, it's your life science slash biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are wrapping up our 10th unit on intro to ecology by studying population ecology. In our last video, we talked about the energy flow in ecosystems and what ecology is as a broad uh, field of study, right? So if we're studying ecology, we're studying not only living things, but how they interact with their environment. And this can be studied at different levels. So we talked about ecosystems, we talked about communities a little bit, we talked about biomes, and today what we're focusing on are populations, which as we might know is a group of organisms all of the same species living in the same area. And how we're going to study population ecology is through what we call population dynamics. It has to do with how and why populations grow and decline and how they can affect each other. Um, so here's the first question I have for everybody. Is deer hunting beneficial for Midwestern ecosystems? If so, how? So every you know, every fall there's deer season and, you know, people go get to shoot them with bows and arrows and with shotguns and stuff. Um, is that a good thing? You might feel a certain way about it. You might go hunting yourself, but is it a good thing for the ecosystems? And if so, how? Um, the second question I have for everybody is, uh, has to do with wolves. Wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park in the 1990s, and the ecosystem has been doing much better since then, besides more frequent wildfires due to climate change. Um, why is that? So other than the fact that wolves are really, really cool and they're very interesting to study and they're very intelligent animals, uh, why is the ecosystem doing so much better at Yellowstone National Park, the world's most famous national park, um, now that they're back? Okay, why is that? All right, so uh, we're going to find those out over the course of the video here, but uh, let's get started. Um, first couple points I want to make when it, with regards to population ecology. Populations of organisms within an ecosystem undergo changes depending on many factors within their ecosystem. So once again, ecology is the study of not only living things, but how they interact with the environment and how they interact with each other. Um, and these factors here are, are going to affect a population's density and a population's growth. And if we're measuring those two things, we are studying what's called population dynamics. How does it change? How does it shrink, grow, whatever? Um, that's what we're going to be looking at today. So two things that we're going to be calculating here in a little bit, population density and then population growth. Okay, and we're going to be doing a little bit of math. Another thing that we could study, but we won't get too, too much in this video, is population dispersion. Is it uniform? Are individuals spread out evenly across an area? Is the dispersion random, meaning there's some are clumped, some are spread out um, within an area? Or are they clumped, meaning are is there a high density of organisms in one small area and then there's not a whole lot um, in the other parts of that territory or habitat? Um, those are population dispersions and those tie in closely with population density which is something that we are actually going to be calculating here. And An easy way to think of population density is to think about it in terms of people and where, where they live. Um, so I live in a rural community and I imagine many of us that are watching do too. Um, so in a rural community, there's not a whole lot of people in it, and we're pretty spread out, okay? So uh, there, there's a very low population density in my part of the world, our part of the world that we live in. Um, very low population density there, but in a city, say this is like, I don't know what this is, this might be like Chicago or New York or something, um, there's a very high population density, lots of people in a small area, it's very densely populated. Right, So we can calculate population density, um, and we use this in biology quite a bit. We can calculate that um, using the equation D equals N divided by A. D stands for density, N stands for the number of organisms in a population, and A that stands for area. Okay, So how many individuals are there in an area, um, and how densely populated is a well, well an area, or how packed together are they? Okay, and this is how we calculate it. We're going to do an example problem here that I'm going to ask you to do. All right, uh, if there are 400 deer in an area of 8 square kilometers, what's the population density? And there, then again, there again is your uh, equation. D equals N divided by A. D equals density. N is number of organisms. A is area. Go ahead and calculate that if you have not already. And then we'll take a look at the answer. What is the density of this deer population? Okay, if you worked it out, it should be 400 divided by 8, 400 deer in an area of 8 square kilometers, and we'll get 50 deer per square kilometer. And that is our population density. All right, and that's pretty high. You know, deer are, deer are pretty well populated, and we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit. We're going to talk about density and how that impacts population growth momentarily. All right, probably by the end of this video. Okay, uh, the other 
factor that we're going to be measuring here. The other way that we can study population dynamics is through population growth rate, and that's determined by births, deaths, immigration, and emigration. Okay, so I have a population of fish here. Um, in a set amount of time, a bunch of them are going to be born. Some of them might enter some from other populations, might enter the population as we refer to immigration. Um, a bunch of them are going to die, probably. And then some might even leave the population to join other populations. Then that's what we know as emigration. Okay, so population growth rate takes those four, uh, four factors into account. Births, immigration, deaths, and emigration. Okay, deaths and emigration are going to decrease a population, and births and immigration are going to increase a population. So if we put those two together, we can see how much net growth the population is undergoing. Okay, so here's our, here's our equation R, that's the variable that we're going to use for population growth rate, equals B plus I, which is births plus immigration, minus, that should say, minus, fixed it, um, deaths plus emigration. Okay, so births plus immigration minus deaths plus emigration. Okay, so I would solve these two separately and then subtract them from each other in order to calculate R. All right, so let's do an uh, example problem with these fish over here. In one month in a school of fish, 56 fish were born, 18 were eaten by predators, 10 immigrated into the population, 6 emigrated out. What is the growth rate? Okay, so use our equation that we have down here, okay, and let's calculate R, the population growth rate. All right, hopefully if you uh, calculated that, this is what we should get. Um, R equals 56 plus 10, because 56 were born and 10 emigrated, minus 18 plus 6, and that's because 18 died and 6 emigrated out. So that means that the population experienced a net growth of 42 fish per month. Okay, and by net, I don't mean like they were caught in a net. Um, I mean that net is like the total if you take out, um, if you factor in how many died and emigrated to. Okay. All right, so 42 fish per month, that would be our population growth rate. Okay, now, uh, with population growth rate in mind, okay, there's two different patterns in which populations grow, and this is the next part of the population dynamics that we're going to get into here. Growth rate, what we were just calculating, depends on environment and the resources that are available to a population. Okay, so in this uh, GIF I have over here, this is a this is E. coli growing in a petri dish, and uh, as you can see, the time's going up here. Um, it's going by increments of two minutes, but check it out. Um, look how that bacteria is growing, and I want you to think about this. Do all populations, every population of organism, does it grow like this bacteria is? Hey, look at that. It's kind of terrifying a little bit. Ugh, right? Um, so do all populations grow like this? And you're probably thinking like, no, definitely not. All populations do not grow like that. But sometimes if you give them enough space and you give them enough resources, you give them ideal conditions and a population will um, experience what's called exponential growth. Or is when a population size increases dramatically over a short period of time. Okay, so not only does in exponential growth, not only does the population size grow, but the rate at which the population is growing is also increasing, which means it's accelerating just like that um, bacteria that we were just looking at. We started with a few, then the population got bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it got faster and faster. Okay, that's exponential growth. Okay, and how we can identify exponential growth on a growth curve or a, or a graph, okay, if this is what we're going to be looking at here, um, how we're going to be determining what type of growth if we graph it, right? So check it out. Here's our time over years, okay? It's not always going to be in years. Sometimes it could be days, seconds, minutes. Um, and here's our population on the y-axis. If we have a J-shaped curve here that's going to swoop straight up like that, okay, that is going to be exponential growth, all right? Um, and that exponential growth is what happens when there are no limiting factors, and it's in ideal conditions. It will keep growing and growing and growing and growing, and it's going to get faster and faster. But, okay, ideal conditions don't happen very often, so most populations experience limiting factors, and they show what's called logistic growth, which is a growth, another type of growth, um, or another pattern of growth, I should say, where a population begins to grow slowly and then grows rapidly, then levels off. 
Okay, so at the beginning of this, uh, this first 10, maybe 20 years here, it kind of looks like we're experiencing exponential growth. But as, the, as we go on, we start to approach this line, this, uh, this factor called the carrying capacity, which is denoted as K here. As, as this line goes up, as it gets closer to the carrying capacity, it starts to level off, and that slope gets very, very flat, which means the population is not going to be growing um, very much anymore as it approaches this, this dotted line up here, the carrying capacity. Okay, so that is logistic growth, and that's what most populations are going to experience because they're going to have limiting factors. There's some, going to be something stopping them from growing exponentially. Okay, so what that line I was referring to, that K value, um, is what we call the carrying capacity. So populations do tend to grow exponentially until they reach that carrying capacity. And what we define carrying capacity is, and this is going to be important to know, uh, the maximum population size of a species that an environment can consistently support in terms of resources. So there's always a limit. Okay? If there's too much competition, if there's not enough space, if there's not enough food, there's too many predators, something like that, that is going to all impact of an area's carrying capacity, the maximum number that it can support in terms of resources. Okay? Um, so this carrying capacity is going to be a huge factor. Um, and when it comes to population dynamics, okay? So carrying capacity can change and is determined by what we call limiting factors, and that's our last thing that we're gonna study in this video here. So check it out, here's our exponential growth curve. If, you, uh, if we take a look, we do have a carrying capacity over here, and if we've got exponential growth and we go past the carrying capacity, what happens? Population is going to, well, the, the environment can't support them, so the population, some of them are gonna die off. Then they're gonna approach carrying capacity, and then they're going to die off again. And that's going to happen again and again and again um, until this population growth has started to level off. So another model for how logistic growth works is kind of looks like this. And something that's uh, important here is that the carrying capacity can be degraded. So depending on um, the health of the environment, okay, carrying capacity can change, can be altered, and it can be lowered. So the maximum number can be lowered over time. Okay? Um, so limiting factors, which is what cause a carrying capacity, affect the carrying capacity of the environment and they can either be put in two categories. They're either density dependent or density independent. And here's density coming back into the picture, right? So the limiting, what limits a population from growing can either factor in density as part of the, part of why it's being limited or it doesn't matter how densely populated um, a population is it can be limited in other factors, all right? So here's two examples right here. Predation is a limiting factor, and something that, like a natural disaster, like a wildfire, might be um, another example of a limiting factor, okay? But uh, here's, here's how we categorize them. They're density-dependent or they're density-independent. And I'm going to cover up my wolf here. Um, the density-dependent factors are factors affected by population density. The larger the population, the greater the effect, okay? So... Um, if there's a lot of organisms in one small area that's very dense, right? And once, uh, once a population is dense enough, okay, things like predation and competition or disease or parasites are going to start taking hold and they're going to start to limit that population growth. And that's what we refer to as a density-dependent limiting factor. Okay? And this is what's going to cause that carrying capacity here. Uh, one of those factors that are going to cause the carrying capacity that. You can't support that many if the, everybody's competing or if there's diseases or something like that. Okay, and then the last thing that we're going to talk about today are density independent factors, and these are going to limit a population's growth regardless of density. It doesn't matter if they're very spread out and there's not many organisms in an area or if it's packed in like sardines, these factors here are still going to limit population growth. Um, and some examples of density independent factors or independent factors are um, weather, natural disasters, and human activity, right? So urbanization, the expansion of cities, is definitely going to be limiting population growth um, in this area. Well, because people moved in and get rid of all the, the vegetation, and we replace it with concrete. So there you go. Um, and then wildfire is obviously going to limit um, population growth as well, right? That's just their destruction of their habitat, right? And both of these are. Okay? 
Um, so coming back to our initial questions, is deer hunting beneficial for Midwestern ecosystems? If so, how? Well, here it is. White-tailed deer in the Midwest no longer have natural predators to limit up their population growth, which is our fault. Okay? This negatively affects plant life and thus the carrying capacity. Okay, um, So that means that if we don't hunt these deer, then uh, well, plant growth and plant biodiversity is going to be is going to be suffering as a result of that. Um, and what we do is because these deer, if we didn't um, have if we didn't provide them with predation, those deer would probably still be growing exponentially, and then our, there'd be way too much density of deer. So hunting actually limits population growth and provides a density-dependent limiting factor that otherwise would not be in there anymore because you know. Their natural predators are gone, so we're kind of solving our own problem. Um, which, coincidentally, ha are these guys right here, the wolves. Hey, the Yellowstone has been doing great ever since they've been brought back. It's the same reason as the last page. Okay, why are they so important? Because they're natural predators and they limit populations. They kind of factor in as the density-dependent limiting factors of those other uh, populations. All right, so they limit herbivore population and thus help maintain vegetation and plant life in Yellowstone that increases the biodiversity and the carrying capacity of the park. So it's a great thing to have predators. All right, um, that is it for this video and this unit. Please let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you next time.